Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And today's guest is someone, if you're watching the video, if you're not watching, you should probably watch because I will guarantee you recognize my guest, Grandmaster Gerald Akamura. We're going to talk to him in just a moment. Thank you for being here, sir. If you're new to what we do, please check out WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for all the things related to the show, transcript, linked, all kinds of things like that. And if you're up for supporting us in our mission to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world, check out whistlekick.com for all the things we have over there. So, sir, thank you for being here. It is a pleasure. Your beard is so much better than mine. Well, like I said, it's the other way around. I'll turn it around. The thing is, I'm honored to be part of your production, your projects. Uh, thinking of me as being one of the guests, uh, that's an honor for me. So, you know, I, I really thank you. Uh, the other thing is that, yes, you and your audience have to be listening to all of this stuff. You know why? Because, you know, mm. I'm the bad guy and I will look for you to be part of this podcast. Mm. And I hope you as the interviewer can come up with some juicy questions. I will try. I will do my best. I'm getting the sense that maybe there's some uh, uh, some consequences if I don't. I don't know that that was in the rider anywhere, but I have it in my. We'll see. We'll see where it comes. And I have an arm that reaches far and abroad. You're laughing. That's not good. And we haven't <laughs> even started our interview. I laugh when I'm nervous. Kind of checked it out. Yeah. Kind of controlled that. You got it. You are known as being the bad, not just a bad guy, but the bad guy. When people describe your film career, it's often he's the bad guy in all these films that you've seen. Uh, Did you start out wanting to be a bad guy? No, not really. The thing is, you know, when you start out, in, in, and for me, it's, it's a big accident. Mm. You know, the way I started into the business is that I was training in the martial arts. And one day, my instructor tells me, come over here. I got to talk to you. And uh, he says to me, I got invited to participate in the, in the Kung Fu series with David Carradine. And he says, I don't want to go. Uh, so he tells me, I want you to go in my place. Tomorrow morning, you report to Warner Brothers, 6 o'clock in the morning. You report there in my place. And I mm -hmm. said, yeah, okay. Not knowing the business, you know. So I went. And lo and behold, that's the start of this so-called hmm. movie career. Uh, I don't think it's so-called. I, I think we can all agree. It's well, the it's, thing, a, it's I, a movie yeah, career. It's like circumstances that comes up, you know, I was lucky that when I got there, the technical advisor was Mr. David Chow, not a, not a martial hmm. arts guy that was part of it. He sort of knows my name kind of, but we don't, we didn't really know each other. And I kind of knew his name. And so I explained to him, hey, you know, I don't know what the protocol is here, but, you know, my instructor says uh, he got invited. He don't want to come, told me to come to show up. And here I am. And the guy goes, yeah, we can use you. Stick around. So that's kind of how I started, you know. The, uh, uh, and this was uh, probably the first season of uh, Kung Fu. And this was mm. about 
the last episode of season one. And so I, the character that I got up, Shaolin Priest, flashback, and we're kind of training. So that's, that's kind of, and it was an all day thing. I had hair then. So the first thing the guy says to me, go to uh, makeup. I go to makeup and they says, well, you have two choices. You can shave your head or we can put a skull cap on you. But you're not shaving my head. You know, back then, hey, man, I needed my hair. Flat top, kind of pull back. Anyway, so I said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll take the, the skull cap. So, you know, 6.30 mm -hmm. in the morning, okay, I'm in makeup. And it, it, back then it was not as good of a skull cap like today. I mean, you wore that thing and you were like Frankenstein. You couldn't turn your head to look sideways. You had to actually turn your shoulder. So you work into the shoulder. Mm. It was down the back. So it was very uncomfortable. Did they have to glue it on or was it just kind of stuck on there? Well, the top part is it's just kind of pulled over. It's just, you know, and then there's glue around the edges. Okay, so now this is 6.30 in the morning. So come lunchtime, it says, okay, you guys break for lunch. Okay, so where are we going? I said, well, you, you stay in your wardrobe. You go to the commissary. You know, goes, you know what is all this gig? I, first time for me. And so I was kind of embarrassed to go to the cafeteria, you know, dressed mm. like that. But, you know, now you're at the movie lot. You get there. There's other people all in costume, wardrobe. So that wasn't no big deal. The big deal is that, okay, after lunch, again, you sit around and you wait until they get ready for, to use you. So all this time, I have my skull cap on, and every time I walk around, I hear goosh, goosh. So now I got a lot of sweat in there, and that, it's filling up. It's filling up. So by the time I got ready to shoot, which was like about seven o'clock at night, you know, wardrobe comes over and he says, oh, wait a minute. Uh, we have to drain, <laughs> we have to drain the perspiration. Like, what are you talking about? So the guy kind of, kind of pulls up a little flap here and man, the water, the sweat just kind of put on, it kind of Crashed mm. around, try to get as much out, slap that back in. So, yeah. So, from about 6.30 in the morning to about 7 o'clock, wow. 7.30. Yeah. So, that was my experience. And I was uh, really uh, uh, not prepared to stay in the business. It was like, wow, I worked. And, you know, it was just one of those real short uh, scenes and you know mm. it's shorter by the time they cut it so you know for me man I'm telling everybody hey hey you know next week Wednesday or, or Friday I'm on I'm on Kung Fu I'm on Kung Fu I told everybody and you know how that goes you know my aunt says to me after after the the showing, she says, I didn't catch you. I said, yeah, I was there very short. She goes, I must have gone use the, the bathroom during intermission or something because I didn't see you in this. And, you know, to this day, it's almost like I'm not telling anybody if, if in case I do anything else, I'm not telling anybody I'm on because it could end up on the cutting floor or, you know, that kind of deal. So, but that was, that was my first experience uh, in the business. I mean, just kind of by accident, getting there. Had you wanted to do acting at all or was it, did you go only because your instructor asked you to? Only. I, oh I, I thought I was done. I thought I was done with the business. 
uh, not knowing uh, you had to join the union. Uh, mm-hmm. But then, uh, back then, uh, you could work on a SAG project and they, the Taft Hartley Act was in there. So it was, uh, it was okay for you to work. The second time you had to join that kind of mm-hmm. deal. And the second time came around, I think the next year when, uh, when, uh, uh, I did a movie. So I did a TV. Now I, I'm getting involved in this, uh, in a movie project. And the way it happened is another fellow uh, martial artist calls me up and he goes, hey, Jerome, uh, I need to borrow some of your weapons for an interview. And I said to him, I said, uh, hey, hey, where my weapons go, I go. And he goes, yeah, yeah, we can go together as a team and then we'll, we'll put on a presentation. And there was uh, Killer Elite. I don't know if you remember the movie Killer Elite mm-hmm. with uh, James Caan, and he was just coming off of uh, Godfather. So it had some really big names. Sam Peckinpah was the, the mm-hmm. director. So again, here we go, and you know we do do our thing, uh, and and both of us got picked. You know, so that was again my first involvement in a movie project which is really different from shooting at a, uh, a TV episode, you know, so, but that, that was the two things that kind of stuck. And then again, what happened is that, can you hear my telephone? You hear my telephone? Yeah. Okay, yeah, wait, wait. It's okay, Hang keep on. going. That might be my agent. Oh yeah, yeah. Hello? Yes, yes, I'm available. Yeah. Uh, I'm just have. I got an interview. I got a podcast going. Yeah, yeah. I, I can make it this afternoon. Is it a big pot? Fairly big pot. Well, at this stage, I'll take. I'll take anything. I'll go for the interview. Yeah, and then you 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 negotiate whatever you can get for me for this thing. It, I mean, if they pick me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just talking to some guy. He's interviewing me for a podcast. Yeah. All right. I'll talk to you again. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Sorry, Jeremy. No, but, you know, quite all right. I understand. You're, you're, yeah, you know, you're an important man. Work. Yeah. No, so. We all, we all have to, we have to work. You like to have fun. I mean, that is, that is very clear. When did TV and movies become fun? Was it fun at the beginning or did it take some time for it to be enjoyable? Uh, well, let's see, how can I answer that? When I did the movie, uh, then I started just talking to people. The first thing they said is I need an agent. So, okay. So I go to this one uh, agency that takes uh, all the Asian actors. And the first thing that the the guy tells me is that, are you willing to go to school to train to become an actor? And I says, there's no way, because while all of this was happening, I also was working for an aerospace company. That was my Mm. primary job. So the movie stuff was kind of like a hobby. Mm. Um, The way that I present myself on on episodes, I mean, scenes or character is kind of from the gut, you know. And the thing was kind of easy because most of the stuff was bad guys, you know. You don't have to look for that. I found out the hardest thing to uh, portray was a comedian. You know, I've I've done that. I'll talk to you about that later on. But I did a a comedy thing. And if you don't get a laugh, you're dead. Right? (laughs) On a comedy skit, being a bad guy, Man, 
you know, you can screw up and you can cover that just like that, right? Just get mm-hmm. even more mean, you know? So, so that's kind of the way that I approach this. Not not making the movie stuff as my primary job. The thing is, it's not consistent. I had a 40-hour job. So I had to I had to keep that as the primary to feed the family. So, what were you doing for the aerospace company? Uh, I started out as, uh, you might not know, a jig and fixture building, development mm-hmm. operations. So I really touched just about everything that Douglas, McDonnell Douglas, uh, their product. And I ended up Boeing, when Boeing bought McDonnell Douglas. Out. Mm-hmm. So I, I have like... 44 years with them. So I've touched a lot of things before they actually go into production. Uh, but the jigs and fixtures, uh, that kind of stuff, uh, tool and die. So what it is is that uh, fixtures that you put things together to build like a section of the plane and then you send it on to like St. Louis and they, they you know, one of the Major for me that was fun was that we had a uh, when the F-15 was introduced, uh, it 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 was a kind of crash program where we were working uh, back to back, uh, twelve hour shifts, first and second shift, just to get all that, and it was uh, an area of the F-15 which is uh, the first time that I came across that was a variable inlet mm. it was kind of kind of new but, but yeah yes yeah, so to shoot some of this stuff you know i had to get kind of creative on how to get away to do the projects so uh, but there, there's there's a lot of similarity there too right like if i'm understanding your your job your your day job you had to figure out what you could do to support the piece that was that needed to be built. Kind of the same thing in acting, right? Yeah. You 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 knew where you had to take the character, and it sounds like it was up to you. How do you support that and, and move things forward? Yeah, you know, you're the first guy that came across to make the similarities. Really, thank you. Really, you told me I had to ask good questions. Well, you know. Now, now you you get a little bit ahead of me, and uh, you know, I I'm the guest. That's true. I I'm supposed to be looking better than you asking the questions, you know. So it's kind of pissing me off, but that's okay. I'll get back. We'll, we'll fix it. <laughs> All right, let's get going, man. I like this. Good. How about your audience? Do you guys are enjoying this, or is it too boring? I said you just you let Jeremy know, and then we can maybe spice this up, or we can tone it down. Oh, n- never tone it down. There you go. Always spice it up. I'm with you. Always, always more. I'm with always you. Always more. Always more. So you went and and you talked to this agent. And you said, no, I'm not going to be able to go to school because you've got your day job. Did that, it, it would it would sound to me like that would mean you wouldn't get parts, but obviously you got parts. So what, what was it that made that well, work out? The thing is, uh, I, I really changed agencies just to get uh, away from, because the Asian agency had their people established so the new guy coming in and the new guy is not interested in training himself and and get into some college courses or whatever you know so i i change but again the thing is a lot of times uh you know uh it's it's kind of what you look like right you know how that Mm. goes it's like so my thing, what happened was that uh, 
while I was training in the martial arts, I dislocated my shoulder. I mm. had hair and all that stuff. Okay, so I dislocated my shoulder working out. So then it became the question of, do I let my hair grow or do I cut it? Mm. So I elected to, to cut it. And the way, the way uh, I approached it was I went out and got one of those uh, clippers and you mm -hmm. put an adapter on and had had the wife just kind of run it over my head. So, you know, say you have a number one adapter. So you just go buzzing. And, and, that, and that was cool. So that was a different look. Uh, until one day when she was uh, uh, doing all of that, she forgot to put the adapter on. So now... This kind of picture, she starts on this side and she runs the clippers. But guess what I ended up with? It's a nice, clean stripe all the way. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> so the choice again is, well, you must have do the rest of the head. So I ended up real short mm -hmm. until... Uh, uh, you would know Eric Lee, my good friend Eric yeah. Lee, martial artist, uh, yeah. King of Kata. Anyway, we're good friends, so uh, he calls me for a, uh, a project. And I, I had those short hairs, and all he, all he said was, hey, are you willing to shave your head? I, you know, the difference, I'm, I'm already there. So that's how I started shaving my head just by that project. And then uh, I found out that uh, going on interviews, it seemed like I was the only bald-headed guy. So that mm. kind of, hey, kind of stood out there. You know, uh, I was lucky in getting cast for all these different parts, and it ended up uh, special for different reasons. You know, so uh, I I didn't start that early, you know, because it, it wasn't my gig. I was more concentrating more on on training in the martial arts. Uh, but, well, let, let, let's talk about your training. Well, uh, training starts way back, you know, like yeah, like uh, when I was twelve back in uh, Hilo, Hawaii, where I was born and raised. Uh, so I started judo, uh, and, and I've told this story, but once before, I get into uh, the division, uh, age di division. I think it was twelve to thirteen, judo. Okay, so I just started. I'm wearing a white belt, and. Uh, I win, I win my division. So I'm up there in a podium or whatever with the second and third guys. And I'm looking either for a medal or for a trophy. And uh, the first place prize was an aluminum green color suitcase. If you picture that. <laughs> For, for, oh, for winning a judo man. tournament as a 12 year old, they uh, gave you a suitcase. Uh, <laughs> Who picked out the prizes? You know, I, I don't know. They, they, they must have just said, well, in this division, that's it. First prize gets a, a green, I mean, a, an aluminum. And I, I've had that aluminum uh, suitcase for a while. I mean, for a long while. Because yeah. then I started putting all my weapons in there whenever I go to interviews. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it, maybe about six years, seven years ago is, is when I finally uh, got rid mm. of it. Uh, uh, even with some weapons in it. Uh, but it was kind of 
you know, like I said, I haven't told that story uh, uh, in many interviews. And I think it's, this is only a, the second time that it's I. It's a pretty good and story. And the thing is, the, the first time it was, well, now it's kind of funny. I mean, now I like to tell you, hey, I won my division, and I, they didn't give me a medal or a, a trophy, you know. And they gave me this green aluminum suitcase. It, it, it sounds like a bad joke, right? It sounds like a, ba- a bad joke from a sitcom. <laughs> but, well, what are, what are we going to give the, the kid who wins? Well, give him a suitcase. <laughs> I don't understand the joke, right? Like, it sounds like a joke that just doesn't. But, but well, truth is stranger than fiction. When it's, well, yeah, back then it was like, I don't want it. Right, I'm here, I'm here for a trophy, right? But what are you gonna do? That that was the only reward that I got for winning it. So, yeah, I took it home. Show sure. my dad, hey, he goes, let's see your trophy. Uh, I said, Dad, here it is. What's that? That's a green suitcase, aluminum at that. <laughs> So you're probably the only second guy that I'm uh, sharing this with you. It's very well, I'm, precious. I'm, I'm thankful. Precious. You and your audience. What, but, but that winning a suitcase obviously didn't deter you from training. Oh, no, no, no. It was like I might train on something else. If they're going to give me a green aluminum suitcase maybe i better train in something else other than judo you know you know that mentality yeah, yeah. but it, it it was a while i played a lot of little league pony league you know baseball so mm-hmm. that's kind of uh, i got i got away from it uh, and, and following up in my martial arts career uh, I went uh, I, I went into the army in 58 uh, about 60 61 I got orders to go to Korea Korea was a hardship tour so it was only like 13 months so while I was there uh, the military uh, post that I was uh, assigned to had a Taekwondo class going. So that's kind of where I picked up my karate training or experience. Mm. Uh, so uh, just kind of jumped. Was it something you were passionate about or was it something you did to pass the time? Well, the thing is, you know, uh, in Hawaii, they really didn't have much of say, martial arts. Hmm. Uh, this, you know, so taking judo was at a basement of a church. And then all of a sudden they introduced Aikido. But then it became real secret. You couldn't watch the training. Number two, you had to go to the police station and register your hand. Why? I don't know. Okay, so because it became that secret training, you know, and, and at the basement of the church, you know, we trained there in judo, so we know all the little secret places where you kind of sneak. So we used to sneak around just to watch the train. So I got a little bit you know, watching uh, the Aikido guys. So I pick up this, pick up that kind of deal. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So the, the martial arts stuff kind of st- stayed with me. Uh, mm-hmm. Getting introduced to Kung Fu Sun Tzu later on coming up here, after military and all that. So this is in like 61 
that I got out of the service, came up here. Uh, I went to school as a uh, aircraft mechanic. Uh, mm-hmm. And at that time, I got introduced to this Kung Fu Sun Tzu. So the thing was still in me as as a discipline more than anything else. You know, I, you need okay. some something, somebody just to kind of guide you, uh, you know, when you, you kind of get off the beaten path. Uh, so then when I, when I took uh, Kung Fu Sun Tzu or Sun Tzu Kung Fu is what they also call it. Uh, it seemed like everything was there. And it, for me anyway, I didn't really have to go uh, search out other martial arts. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying they're good, they're bad. It was different. Sometimes I go visit uh, friends uh, that are instructors, and I talk with them. I, I pick up everything. And one of the things that my instructor told me uh, when I was training in uh, Kung Fu Sun Tzu, he tells me, I want you to be a garbage disposal. If you take in everything, what you don't want, you grind it and drain it. Mm-hmm. So it's a great metaphor for that. No, I like so that. my thing is yes, because yeah. what's good for me might not be good for you, might not be good for mm-hmm. the next guy. You know, you pick and choose. So I thought it was a, a fulfilling type of concept. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't have to go because he had everything. He had everything in there. Yeah. You've mentioned your weapons a few times. I, I think you even said, did you, what, you said to somebody, where my weapons go, I go. So obviously your weapons were something important to you. You even kept them in the suitcase, you said. What was it about weapons training that appealed to you so much? And did you know you wanted to train in weapons before you started training weapons? The concept behind weapons and weapons training, weapons, the uses of weapons. You know, the, the, the one thing that uh, uh, my instructor uh, brainwashed me was that, hey, the weapon is an extension of you. So that means you can grab a sword but once you grab the sword, you can't use the same hand to grab something else. So be careful on what weapon and how you use it. So then, it, for me, it became more of a discipline, finding what you can do with it more than, and then what the limitations are. You know, sometimes, yeah, you have a sword. But you do have limitations because you have to hold the handle. Once you hold the handle, that hand can't grab anything. So you have to rely on the blade. Now you find what the blade can do for you in place of your hand. You know, so that kind of philosophy, that kind of training is is more mental, right, than physical. But you need to know all the aspects of what I call a toy. The toy uh, needs to be uh, in front of you with the pluses and the minuses. For me, anyway, that's that's the way I took in everything. But the mystery of the ninjutsu art was, hey, I can hide stuff and I can use it when I need it. So that mystique kind of kept me interested in weapons. Mm. But there was always this perfect, because, you know, if you're, you know, like a ninja, okay, you have stars, okay? Mm -hmm. So in a movie, the shooter king is made 
with good metal points and all that. Look fancy, real thick. Okay, you're throwing it away. <laughs> Even if you throw it to your enemy, you kill the enemy. But if you want it, you got to go retrieve it. Mm. Now, in reality, you would think that they would get, and they didn't have that much availability of metal, but all this rusty stuff, that was the metal. I mean, that was the the metal that they used for their weapons, right? Mm. I got a bunch of rusty old anything. I don't care what shape it is. If I throw it at you for a distraction, I'm not going to pick it up. You know, I'm going to find another mm. another hut that has more of those rusty right. objects, metal, whatever. So the mentality is, for me, I play with that kind of idea and concept. You know, mm. pluses and minus, pluses and minus, yin and yang. So you kind of play with that. But then at the same time, uh, you get uh, caught in, hey, what about if you have this kind of weapon? Hey, what if you have this kind of weapon? And then kind of jumping ahead of your question, then it's like the movie comes in. Huh? Oh, no, wait. Hey, hey, hey. You know, that opens a lot of doors, opens a lot of minds, a lot of eyes. Sure. And you go, hey, okay, I throw the star. But what if it's attached to a chain? I can pull it back to me after I use it, right? You know, right. things like that. It, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of have to uh, think about things like that when, when uh, you talk about weapons. You know, hmm. right off the bat, this is don't throw your weapons away. But then you see all the ninja guys, man, they're throwing stuff, you know, daggers, whatever. And you never see them go and pick it up. You know, they take off. That's the chance, the distraction that they have just to escape. So, so they're, they're comfortable with that. So, you know, Weapons can go, boy, it, you you start on weapons with me. It's like, you know, uh, the yin and the yang just kind of grasp you with, like, which which direction you want to go, you know? It's like, you know. Do you have a favorite weapon? Well, see, at the same kind of question later on, you're going to ask me, which is my favorite movie? I know you're going to ask me that. Actually, I usually don't ask that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know I, what? I, I usually don't. Um, I, I used to when I was you in a novel interview. But I know you now. You are going to ask me that. I, I am now. Yeah, see? I knew that. Anyway, we'll get to Actually, that. I'm going to ask you who your least favorite director was. Oh, <laughs> get you in trouble. I do, have, I do have a name. I do have a name. Uh, uh, I did a TV. I did a TV um, series. Uh, a man called Sloan with Robert mm -hmm. Conrad. Robert Conrad was my big hero when he did Wild Wild West. Mm -hmm. You remember that? All yep. the. Like a ninja, right? A lot of, lot of yeah. imagery. He was my big hero. And then I had a chance to work on a new project that they were developing called A Man Called Sloan. So Conrad was in it. Mr. Conrad, Robert Conrad. And I got a chance to do some stunts on it. And I went, this is it. I'm going to I'm going to finally meet my hero. Now, you can delete whatever I say. <laughs> Cause I have a feeling I know where this is going. This guy is a prick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
about the time I was doing the TV, he was doing that commercial with the battery and says, I dare you. No, you you might be too young for that. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I think that's before me. He had that energized battery on there and his, you know, his thing is, okay. I dare you knock it off. Oh, man. I would have bought I would have bought a dozen of them suckers. And uh, he wasn't the director. He was the main actor. Sure. They had a female director. And that guy actually took over the female director. Uh, I, I, I don't want to say job, but when we were shooting the scene, he was the one that was calling the shots. And I go, Wait a minute, you're the actor. Mm. Why are you directing? There is a director. So now let's turn it around 180 degrees. Which is which is the best director that I work? Mm. Huh? Okay, so now yeah. everything comes down to big trouble. For me, it seems like it's the most iconic project that I worked on. I think it's the one people most know you from. Right, right. And it was Carpenter that created that that character that that I uh, uh, I used in, in, in the project. Yeah. Uh, it was one of those where cattle call audition, everybody goes there. I take one of my students, I throw him around, but I also brought some of my weapons that I created, you know, for the movie. In the suitcase? Huh? Did you bring the, did you bring the weapons in the suitcase? In the suitcase, in the attaché case, in a foot locker. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> Those kind of stuff, I used to take everything. Foot locker, suitcase, at the share case, anything I, I could, just to, just in case, just in case. Yeah. So anyway, audition and all that, and you know they don't tell you right off the bat if you get it. They say thank you, you go home. Uh, that afternoon, I get a call. They say, hey, and and I know the, the stunt coordinator, and he says, hey, uh, we want to use you on this project. Oh, okay. Cool. Said, okay, tomorrow you go down 20th century, go to prop shop, and, and they'll give you your weapons for this project. So I go there, and, and it, it's kind of like, kind of like, uh, uh, I, I, like a bantam chicken. Man, you know, my chest is out there because I got picked, right? And, the, and on top of all of this, he tells me, I'm leaving your name at the gate so you can drive on the lot. Oh, mm. boy. Hey. You know, I'm a movie star now, right? Yeah. Drive on the lot. So anyway, I drive on the next morning, and I go there, and I go to a uh, well, prop shop, and I, I go to, uh, I'm Gerald Okamura. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, we know you. Goes, okay, just wait here. We'll bring and the guy comes out and he's holding this two gold plated pearl handle six shooters. <laughs> and he goes, This is what John wants you to have for your character. And I went, I don't care. I'm on the project, right? Uh, you can give me a toothpick. I'm still happy, <laughs> right? It's like, then the other guy comes out and he brings uh, the holster and just so happens, double holsters, and just so happens, it fits me perfect. Mm -hmm. So I put the holster on, I put the guns in, I'm standing there, you know, and I'm really not a gun guy. And then he says, oh, wait a minute. John wants you to have these and the guy comes out with those pendulaires. 
But the big deal is that the big joke, in fact, them sucking bullets are like, you know, it doesn't fit in a six shooter. I mean, the six shooters are, you know. Right. And uh, I said, okay, okay. So that was the, the kind of joke. I don't know if a lot of people caught on right away. I think when it got shown as a theater, I don't think they kind of caught the the joke. But all the repeats and all that, everybody, you know, like it, now with Facebook and stuff, they said, you know, I bet you you were happy that you didn't have to reload your six shooters with those bullets. It never fits in the six shooter. You know, that kind of that kind of joking kind of, you know, stories, though. And, but, but, not to interrupt you, I know you were going to ask me a really nice I did. There was something I wanted to ask you, but keep going. Yeah, it's like, okay. And so I said, okay, this is my character. What I didn't know was that, and I found out later, Big Trouble in Little China was supposed to be a Western. Huh? You didn't know that. News to you? I didn't know that. Yeah. So later on, I'm thinking, shit, I must have been the only Western guy, right? Six shooters. I mean, they had guns, rifles, and all that, but they were all dressed in. I mean, I was dressed in, in, in the Wing Kong, the black pants and the gear. But I had those. All through the whole shoot, I had the six shooters on me with the bandolero. So, yeah. I, I'm, I was just kind of guessing that I was the token Western guy, you know. So, but yes, that would be one for a reason would be one of the major. And then John, talking about directors, uh, is one of two directors in all the times that I worked with all the different projects that know me by my first name. Hmm. Ah. Sam Peckinpah would be the, the other of the two. Those two guys will call me by my, the other guys, they wouldn't know me. Hey, 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 kind of, yeah. But man, John Carpenter and Sam Peckinpah, I cannot go wrong. Can't go wrong. It says a lot, I imagine, about the impression you made, but also the kind of people they were. Could be. Could be, you know, it's like, and that's why I say, you know, I know other friends of mine started way before me, you know, as stunts and all that stuff. Uh, but it seems like some of the projects that I got attached to or participated in, this always something that's happening that, you know, I, I can share with, with uh, people like you on interviews and stuff, you know, where it's kind of funny. For me, it's really funny. Uh, but, you know, behind the scene kind of stories, to me, is the most enjoyable. You know, yeah. whether, it's, whether it's good or bad, whether it's good or bad. You know, some of them is bad, you know what I mean? Some of it is really negative, but what are you going to do, right? So for me, I, I kind of use it as conversation, you know. And it, do, it, do you it, have any of those those bad stories that you want to share? No. Okay. No. I'm, hey, I'm the bad guy. I don't have any bad stories. No, but of other people. What other people, people bad stories. Because right. I'm sure you have none. Yourself. I don't, I don't bother with other people. I concentrate about me and only. Mm. So don't get sidetracked with other people. This is my okay. interview, right. and I expect you to be on the up and up, and just concentrate your effort only at me. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we can continue. When when. Huh? <laughs> oh, I'm when, enjoying this, Jeremy. I'm, I'm glad. I am too. When, when I talk to artists, whether it's 
actors, musicians, uh, painters. Sometimes when they're in the middle of putting something together, writers, they know that there's something that's going to be good there. It's not even done and they, they know that it's going to be good. Was there any hint of that? Because Big Trouble in Little China, while maybe not the biggest commercial success, has a, a really strong cult following. Oh. People love that film. Yeah. Did you know while you were on set that it was going to be that kind of movie? Yeah. No. Because you, you, if you remember, the theatrical release was a bomb. A bomb. That's what I thought I remembered. Yeah. I, I, I it, it, didn't want to commit to that, but I didn't remember it. It just never went anywhere. One of the problems was uh, the Asian people that gave the okay. <laughs> this is the funny part. The premiere was uh, uh, Big Trouble was on the 20th century lot. Hundred dollar mm -hmm. plate dinner and premiere and that they were going to donate the proceeds to Chinese community, Asian community. So they take the money. Thank you. And then they start shooting down the project. From what I heard. From what I heard. Hmm. And even uh, I was hearing a story about that's why John didn't want to do it. At that time, John didn't know. Now, I could be wrong. This might what I heard. That he didn't want to do number two. Yeah, he was having so getting was getting so much flack. Uh, mm. And to me, uh, you know, I don't know because I worked the project. It was like, hey, let's do number two kind of deal. You know, I didn't see anything negative about the whole thing. I felt that it was a, an entertainment. You know, it's not like Oscar kind of but it was an entertaining type of. And then what happened when they went VHS and you know all that stuff? No, it's a cult. Now, we already celebrated 35 years, two years ago, you know, mm -hmm. 35 years. The other thing that's nice for me is that my character is as alive, is as alive as the 35 years of the movie. Uh, for some reason, uh, uh, they like to use the, the character as, you know, cartoonish, uh, to whatever they want, you know. Uh, because it's it's distinctive. I mean, no, no one looks like you in that movie. Well, well thank you. I know you're lying, but thank you. <laughs> To add to that, uh, on the 35th anniversary that year, prior to that, we contacted a brewing company in uh, Houston, Texas, you know, where they have the draft beers where you got like 15 different flavors. Yeah. Draft beer, you know. Uh, we got them to do uh, one of me. So I do have my own beer, you know, limited. You have product. your own beer. And with my face on it and that kind of deal. Yeah. So, you know. Oh, that's great. Yeah. The only trouble that's is great. I can't get the beer out of there. You know, uh, the laws are, uh, I, I'm not real sure, but I, I couldn't get them legally to uh, uh, send it to me. Yeah. Well, you got to go. You should have a special night and you can serve beer to people. I mean, well, they, they, they love that. You know, it's... Like, I'd go. You know, it's... Uh, uh, I might have one to show you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> to the audience, if you're listening and not watching, you're missing out right now. I'm telling you, I'm going to look after those guys. I'm going after those guys. You just tell you me which guy is not clicking in. You must have any knowledge. I'll you send you a all list. The electronic tech, all the electronic uh, uh, information. Give me those names that the guys are not tuning in. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll go after. So, I will. I will.
I will let you know. But this is because I'll get emails from people saying, "Oh," problem. and then I think yeah. like the year after that, another company uh, made another one for me. So I got two beers. The only trouble is, is that it's uh, limited, and yeah. I can't get it here. Now, why mm. do I have one here? You know, like everything else. Uh, you know, you get people that very creative. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I got. Some, there are ways. There, there are ways. Yes, and and there are ways. but you know, with with social media, Facebook, and all that, you know. There's other people like in the UK, uh, uh, one of the places. They said, "I know you can't send, you can't send or sell me a beer, you know. But if you drink the beer, and save the can. I'm willing to buy right. the can as, as a collectible, right? Now it becomes a yeah. thing. So again, For sure. talking about this character, man, it's like thirty. Seven years, thirty-eight years. Now that sucker guy is still alive. He's still shooting six shooters. He hasn't reloaded that sucker in thirty-five years. <laughs> <laughs> so again, uh, that's a blessing, uh, you know. Uh, hmm. But again, it's like, yes, it's one of the favorite, but you know, for for a different reason. So there's there's others. You know different reasons. Some of you know, what what are, what are some of the others that stand out for you as well, distinctive roles that you you enjoyed putting together? Well, the thing is, uh, Showdown in Little Tokyo. The only reason mm -hmm. for that was I worked with Brandon Lee. Mm -hmm. So that is special. A little uh, small independent movie, uh, Cage Two. Cage two, Ferrigno was the the lead, but Bruce Lee's daughter Shannon worked on that. So that mm. little bit of that is special, you know. So this, and then uh, this one movie uh, when Police Academy was doing all the movie, uh, we did one called Ninja Academy. So, so that so now I'm the big sensei. You know, they come to my school, and I got to train them. You know, all the different kind of people. So again, that had special, you know, meaning for me. Uh, so it's real hard, uh, you know, just to kind of pick. Uh, then we get into, uh, say, like the Andy Sedaris. I don't know if you know Andy Sedaris. Uh, he had a project like ten projects, but he was used in mm -hmm. Penthouse and and uh, Penthouse and Playboy samples. So a lot of TNA, a lot of explosion, you know that kind of deal. So and that had its own audience because I remember after he passed away, uh, the UK had a anti Sedaris week, so they had uh, mm -hmm. the whole week, you know. Each day had one of his his movies kind of deal. I I was privileged enough to work on four of his. Uh, the first one I I was just a, a a bad guy, and then the other three I actually was one of the principal players. Hmm. To the point of, and listen good now. The whole concept with this group of girls and guys. Uh, was like a private uh, investigation group, you know, not not a government group, but first. anyway, uh, Julie Strain, Julie Strain, uh, she was uh, 83 pet of the year, the penthouse, and it was real tall, mm -hmm. six footer. Uh, she passed away, so rest her so, uh, but. I got a call for that project from uh, Mrs. Severus. <laughs> she tells me, we're, we're looking for a real bad, and not the good kind of bad, but the bad bad, Elvis 
Elvis impersonator. Okay, I said, okay, if you're looking for a bad, bad Elvis impersonator, I can do it. You know, he goes, good. We want you in, in this thing. And then a couple of weeks later, she goes, uh, we might want you to lip sync. And I says, uh, let's get it to be work. No, I got, I got to do some work. Then it was like, well, you're a martial artist. He's, he's a martial artist. Maybe we can get some moves while you sing it. So now it became work. But the funny thing is we went down to uh, uh, Shreveport, Shreveport, Louisiana, hmm. to shoot this thing. And at that time they had those steamboat casinos. You're not familiar with. They're in the river, but it's a paddle yeah. boat that they use as a casino. Yeah. Anyway. I used to work on a paddle boat. It wasn't a casino, but I worked oh, on yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We go there and then the lounge. Well, before that, we went to Vegas. Mm -hmm. I'm the lounge show in Vegas. The Marquis, and, and it was uh, Elvis Fu was my name for that. See, my, my character name was Fuji, Fujiyama, I think. But everybody used to call me Fu. And then just so happened that my, my gig was an Elvis impersonator. So they made me a white jumpsuit and all that. I'm on that stage and, and, <laughs> and well, doing the thing. Uh, you familiar with Elvis's performance, kind of? You know, after he yeah. sings, he pulls out his handkerchief, wipes the sweat off his face, throws the handkerchief to the audience. Yeah, all right. My gig on that, or my take on it, I do all that stuff. I'm done. Oh, I do my little one, 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 little twitch of the nose, and then I pull out my uh, silk uh, uh, blue handkerchief. I'm wiping myself. There's two people in the audience, two females. So I wipe my face, I look around, and I, oh, I throw the handkerchief to her. She catches it. So I, I'm there like that. She throws the handkerchief back to me. <laughs> and I went, what, 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 what? Just to ad lib all of this stuff. <laughs> so I love it. Again, you know, projects like that. I had the luxury of just ad libbing some stuff. So, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. working the low, low budget stuff is fun. You know, the it, it main sounds stuff, like it. everything is union. Huh? So, yeah. So, like, like I said, there's a lot of good stuff, bad stuff, uh, you know. But it's been a fun ride. Yeah. What it's clear what your martial arts brought to your acting, but did you bring anything from your acting back into your martial arts? Uh, I I think for me the biggest would have been uh, discipline. Hmm. Seems like both of them needed needed discipline in one way or the other. Uh, the other thing, uh, uh, going back and forth on those two things would be uh, know when to quit, know when to say no. Uh, if you can't do it, don't tell somebody that you can. Uh, what I'm talking about is the stunts. You know, if you can't yeah. do it, then not. Uh, you know, all the fighting and stuff to me it was kind of, uh, uh, for me, the discipline was there. The thing that I had to remind myself always, and what, 
one of the actors, in fact, Robert Wagner was the one that always said that, you know, he appreciates the, uh, the stunt guys for making him look good. And so that stuck in my, in the back of my mind that kind of reminds me and says, make the actor look good. Don't hit the actor. And that was one of the, the main things. You hit the actor, you're out. Right. Yeah, but they can hit you accidentally. You know, and that and that has happened. You know, I got nailed by Charlie Sheen when I was doing uh, Hot Shots Part Two. I mean, he mm-hmm. nailed me with a back fist to the jaw. Oh yeah, bang! I went woo. And the funny thing was that uh, we were in a uh, like a, a building with rafters. It must have had like about 400 extras in there. You remember the Rambo thing when Rambo went and yeah. fought in the Thailand? Yeah. And they simulated that, so this is the spoof of it. So when Charlie actually nailed me, you know, with the, they didn't have a referee then, but for this thing, they had a referee. When Charlie nailed me, uh, Charlie actually was the first guy that came to me. As soon as the director says, cut. Charlie came and checked on me to see if I was okay. Mm-hmm. But the group, the group started to chant. He says, kill the bastard, kill the bastard. They, they were yelling at Charlie. Kill, they were yelling at me to kill Charlie, man. They were like, boom, boom, boom. So, so the funny part is usually you shoot one good one, and they'll shoot a second for safety. They call it safety, just mm-hmm. in case. And the director says, no, that's it. Moving on. So they only shot one. But uh, that was it. Yeah, it nailed me good. Man. It's a good scene. So, it's a good but scene. Again, it's, it's little things like that that makes the project special for me anyway. You know, So there's a lot of little things. Uh, that whenever I get interviewed, oh, yeah, you remind me of, of those incidents and I get a chance to talk about it. And, and I enjoy it. Mm. And again, it's almost like I need to make you enjoy the interview as well as you people. You know, like, mm. To me, that, that's the whole name of the game. I, I don't care what I do personally, uh, but, you know, if I can share some of the funny things behind the scene, I feel that's a good interview, you know, just, just, yeah. just to share. Uh, yeah. So, uh, when everybody has a good time, everything works better, whether it's, you know, I mean, for me, it's, it's classes. When I teach, I try to make sure my students have fun at the same time I have fun. If we both, if we all have fun, you know, Everybody gets more word. out of that's it. That's a key word. Only three letters in it, but boy, it's big. That mm. word is big, very big, for a whole lot of reasons. Fun. I mean, that's that's key. Do you have any roles upcoming? Oh, you know how old this old body is, you know. I'm, I'm I'm 82 right now. Mm-hmm. In November I'll be 83. Okay. The body is shot, but I can share with you. This is a secret ambition of mine. Okay. okay. So I'm gonna kind of whisper it to you. Okay. At my age, in my physical condition. I am looking for a romantic lead. We'll see what we can do. Yeah, you can do. You got connections? <laughs> well, I know. It depends on what you're looking for. You should s- send me an email with your criteria, and we'll we'll put it out to our audience. And- hey, any romantic lead is okay with me. Okay. I can still grunt. Can't do anything more but grunt. (laughs) 
I love it. I love it. This has been a lot of fun. Oh, really, really appreciate right. you like coming said, on and spending uh, some time you know, with me. Uh, yeah. It seemed like, you know, just talking story with you is like, you know, we go from here, we go from there. Yeah. There's no timeline. Uh, you know, it's not like from this day to this day. I mean, we go from here, we go from, we go back to there. You know why I do it that way? Because I've learned this the hard way. If you, if you, if you're ever really bored and you want something to help you fall asleep, go back and listen to some of the first episodes that I did. And I had questions and I would ask the question and the guest would answer the question. And then I'd ask the next question. And what I found the hard way was I was making it about me and not about the guest. And so now what I do is I just, I figure if I keep you talking, you're probably going to talk about things you want to talk about. So my job is just to keep you talking. So you keep saying things that you're passionate about talking about, and then everybody has a better time. That's a good philosophy. You know, it, it, you know, like uh, two weeks ago, I, I, I got this uh, request for, for an interview. So the very first, and that's the first time anybody asked me that. And, and to, today, when I told you about you know, how old I am and all, this guy, uh, first question on the list is like, uh, nowadays, how old are you? <laughs> so, so somebody told me, are you going to answer that? I said, where I'm at right now, I said, I don't care. I mean, I, I never did care how old I am. I mean, some people are very touchy on that. You know, I mean, so if I was 50, I would tell them I'm 50. You know, so this one here, I just said, well, right now, today, and I gave them the date uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I said, yeah, I'm 82. But if you wait until November of this year, I'll be 83. You know, you know, it's the simple. thing we have the least control over. Simple as that, you know. So, what, you know, at first I thought it was kind of a big deal question because I've never been asked that before. And then after a while I go, ah, you know. So who cares? I'm 82 or 83. It's just that uh, my my acting days or stunt days are kind of, kind of limited. Uh, and I think it, it's between the martial arts stuff and, you know, you get your aches and pains and you get old and all that kind of deal. Uh, but, yeah, but I, I still like to kind of share stories. Sure. So, yeah, I, I call that talk story. You know, I talk story with you. I, I talk story. Yeah. Just, you know, so every once in a while. I love, you know, I love stories. You throw in a particular question, yeah, I'll, I'll answer it. You know that kind of deal. So yeah, yeah. so it, it, it's a it's a fun concept for an interview. I I think it's like, thank you. You know, <laughs> are there any stories? I, I, listen to the whole question. Are there any stories that we missed that you want to share? I want to make sure that we don't end before you. If, if there's something uh, you're holding on to, no, you want to leave us. So much. A story. Story, but uh, again, is an incident that happened uh, when we were shooting uh, Ninja Academy. I had this real big mm -hmm. fight toward the end, you know, with the, 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 the rich school compared to my uh, old old style school, Ninja School, and so we 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 have a conflict there. I mean, a big fight toward the end. So while we're in the process of shooting all that, toward the end of the sequence, I had this guy thrown over a log. He's leaning over a log. So I grab his hair and then I give him a, you know, a palm to the back of his head. <sighs> so I'm doing that about uh, five, five times. 
But after the third third time, I'm getting ready to hit him, and the director yells, cut, cut, and he's yelling, cut, cut. I'm in the middle of this fight. I'm, I'm hyped now. I'm, you know. And then he calls cut. He walks from his chair to at a group of the good and bad guys uh, in ninja outfit. Okay. So he, he walks to the group. He goes straight to this one guy. Okay. And this guy has his glasses on. Yeah, you you way ahead of me. He goes up to him and goes nose to nose, and he goes, "Ninjas don't wear glasses." <laughs> and, and, and that's a buddy of mine. That's a buddy of mine. The guy that had the glasses on. And after the scene, he says, "Don't call me for any kind of work. I'm not working <laughs> with you." No more, he said. That's it. He said, "That's it." And he and and then he had to add, "You ate warm food under a tent because it was kind of raining that one day." And he says, "You feed me box lunch. I got a sandwich. I got an apple. I got a bag of chips and a can of soda." I'm not going to work with you anymore, so don't call me. <laughs> I, I had to throw that in. I had to throw that in. I mean, you know, like everything else, you know, the background people is the background people. I mean, you know, so if you know, if you know the, kind of the concept of, of shooting a movie and stuff like that, you know, there's this half of it here and half of it there, kind of even on a low budget film, you know, but yeah, that, that, that's the kind of story that, uh, I'm hoping that the audience is uh, sharp enough to, to kind of realize what is happening behind the scenes doing, doing the shoot, yeah. you know, things like that can happen. And, and for me, it did happen. So, I, I have fun repeating that. I mean, you know, it's like, come on. I'm halfway there finishing my fight scene. And this guy is like, nothing's happening. He just had his glasses on. What the hell, man? <laughs> so I love it. So that's kind yeah. of some of the stuff, you know. It's, and, and if we come into the end, uh, you know, it's really uh, yeah. what I want to say is, number one, to thank you and Andy, or Andrew, I take that back, uh, for uh, thinking of me and inviting me to be part of your, your, your project. Uh, thank you. Second is that I hope it's enough of uh, entertainment uh, for your people. Yeah, what happened? You cut me off. Was that just- I, I I didn't. I didn't cut you off. No, the internet does things uh, sometimes. No, no, no. So I know you. But I the know recording you that's why we use this software. The recording the software handles all that. I know you guys at the end of the hmm? world. You guys pulling some some crap here. You cutting me off. <laughs> I know that. I know that. This time change. Hey, you guys better watch it because I'm going to be on the plane. The next play, and I'm going to come see you guys. I hope you do. <laughs> come see us for your, When's your birthday? We have a big event in November. You should come see us. Uh, no travel for me. No travel for oh, me. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, like even I haven't been back to Hawaii. That's about a five hour trip on a plane. Uh, I don't know if I can sit for five hours. You know, that kind of deal. But, you know, uh, Getting back to brass decks, I mean, really, uh, I've enjoyed this this uh, interview. Uh, you know, and, and okay. usually what and I, I did my job, and usually what I tell the the people that interviewing me, you know, if it's fun enough, and if you want to do it again, and your audience requests, because I'm going, I'm going to go on and request 
that you do another interview, you know, you know how that uh, I can do it like 25 times and vote. <laughs> so I'm going to vote for myself that you, 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 you work it for another. Year. No, this is just a joke. Now don't, don't take me seriously. Ah, well, halfway. We'll seriously. do a safety take. Uh, just don't take me serious all the way. Just kind of halfway. But again, it's like, I've enjoyed it. Uh, you know, Thank you. Me too. Uh, and, and like I said, uh, I just saw all you know interviews, especially uh, audience. Those are the because I was I was told a long time ago by David Hasselhoff, keep your fans happy. You know, give them sign autograph and all that kind of stuff. Sign the pictures, but they are the only ones that can keep you there. That's David Hasselhoff when I did Night Rider. So, you know, it's always like, uh, yes, you might laugh at some of my jokes and stuff, but, you know, I always uh, have to think about your audience. You know, are they, are they laughing with you and me? Or are they laughing at me, which going to piss me off? You can laugh with me, but not at me. Now, get that straight now. You can laugh with me but not at me. That's my philosophy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you.